So we're, we're studying about uh, the movements of, the, of God through the great controversy. Uh, this is the seventh chapter in the book that we're looking at. And last, uh, last week we uh, emphasized uh, the life of John Huss, who was in between two very important characters in the uh, Reformation of the Church. And we need to remember uh, that, this, that the whole of the great controversy is about the triumph of God's love. We need to see in each of these chapters, each of these experiments in the history of the church, uh, how was it that Jesus triumphed? Did he, you know, did he triumph by overpowering? Did he triumph, you know, like, like you see the, the, the heroes in a, in a TV show, you know, beats everybody down. Is that how that God triumphs in, in the great controversy? By might? No, it's by a different means, isn't it? And so we're going to look at that today. And I may have to call on, uh, yeah, if this is not working, we're going to have to have, there we go. All right, so we looked at this morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe, a couple of weeks back. And then um, we had this next week, we had uh, John Huss. And it's not moving, Adam. So you're going to have to advance for me. And then John Huss. Okay? So it's between the eagle, the star, the morning star, and the eagle was John Huss. And this week, we're going to look at the, the eagle. And to do so, we've got to go back to his humble origins. This is a little village in, in Germany. And uh, yes, Martin Luther. This is where he grew up, little little town there. And I uh, want to say just a word or two about his parents, Hans and Margaret Luther. Uh, this is in their older years, but uh, they were devout Christians, wanted the best for their kids. Uh, Hans worked in the mines. That's got to be one of the hardest, hardest jobs around. And he supported his family, wanted his son to, to progress in society and to be, uh, a, have a better life than he did. And so he insisted that his son, Martin, uh, go off to school. And he went, wanted him to study law. He figured that would be one of the best professions that he could, could have. Um, so Martin went off to the University of Erfurt, and uh, there he distinguished himself. was a was a good good student. Uh, we're kind of sh shortening his story. If you read the Great Controversy, it, it spends more time talking about his childhood and and some of the experiences of his life. Um, I, I would have to say that one of the things his parents were were cared greatly for them, but in the style of the days their care was sometimes a bit harsh, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, they insisted on certain things, and I cannot help but think that that was part of what shaped Martin Luther's understanding of religion in, in general, of Christianity, and of God as a person, because his understanding of God as he went off to study law was that God was stern. Um, this morning in our, our Sabbath school class that, that we had uh, in the pastor study, we talked about the concept of God's justice and th that he wants us to, to be people of justice. The word in Spanish is justicia, and the word justicia can be translated justice, but it's also to be translated righteousness. And there's, there's a shade of difference in the meaning there, and I think that uh, Luther only understood the one concept, and that is correctness and rightness and doing the right thing. And perhaps some of us have grown up with that, that understanding of, of God's righteousness, that it's about doing the right thing no matter what, and it's a bit stern. And, and, and that it was enforced with sternness. Um, we mentioned 
and this is just a kind of a side, side point, we mentioned as we were talking about the concept of God's justice, that the other side of God's justice, and there are two sides to God's justice, is his righteousness, which includes his love. So you can know a person who is correct in this world, who does the right thing, who's always doing the right thing, keeps the law to the letter, but it's not a very nice person, <laughs> not a very warm person, uh, n not, the, not the person that you want to be around. You know they're right, you just are not uh, very much warmed by, by their character. And God's character is both. He is just, but he is also loving. And he's, he's both of those together. So Luther had a, one, a lopsided, a one-sided view of God as a child. And as he went into law, it's just a, a shoe in here, justice is about being right with the law, right? And he studied the law, and he, he did, uh, did well in his studies. And then as he was there in the, the libraries, he ran across something he had never seen before. This is the Latin Bible, which was all that they had. It wasn't in the, in the language of the people at the time. But he discovered this, this Bible. He didn't know that there was so much available. Uh, in, in he had heard some, some lessons from the Psalms and some lessons from the epistles and lessons from the Gospels, maybe. But he, he didn't realize there was this whole book and as he thumbed through it, uh, this, his statement was, oh, that God would give me such a book for myself. He was, he was enthralled with, with the Bible and what it revealed to him. And so he, he, that was his first exposure while studying law at the university. Uh, then something occurred. Um, he was out on a, uh, after... He had uh, graduated, he got his, his degree there, and uh, he was going from his parents' home, and there was a terrible uh, lightning storm, and lightning struck so close to him that it knocked him to the ground. And uh, as he, his response to this uh, was to, to call out and uh, to say, I will become a monk. Somehow he thought that this was the thing to do. In his devotion to his faith, he was going to set aside a lucrative <coughs> life in uh, practicing law. And this put him not only uh, in a very different atmosphere, but it put him at odds with his father because his father didn't think very kindly of the monks. What he knew of the monks and as we have talked about the monks, the monks uh, often were um, you know, traveled about and uh, lived off the people and, and did quite well, actually, living off of other people. And his dad had no respect for that. Well, Luther went into uh, the monastery very close to Erfurt, and uh, uh, I believe it was called the Black Monastery. And there he... Uh, practice the severity that he thought that God required. Um, he not only uh, beat himself, as, as sometimes people would do, but he starved himself, uh, went without meals to continue his, his devotion and his study. Uh, and uh, he, he did everything that he could to become the best monk. Later, as we see in the quotation that, that appears, uh, he said, I was indeed a pious monk, and followed the rules of my order more strictly than I can express. If ever monk could obtain heaven by his monkish works, I should certainly have been entitled to it. If it uh, had continued much longer, I should have carried my mortifications even to death. He took it very seriously. And God's blessing was with him because he met there uh, a superior who was to be a, a mentor to him, a man by the name of Staupitz. We see his picture here. Uh, oh, okay, there we go. Staupitz, Dr. Staupitz. And, and Staupitz um, had a balanced view 
he had more of a, a holistic view of God. Uh, it wasn't just his justice, but it was also uh, to understand his, his love. And uh, Staupitz said to Luther, instead of torturing yourself on account of your sins, throw yourself into the Redeemer's arms. Trust in him, in the righteousness of his life, in the atonement of his death. Listen to the Son of God. He became man to give you the assurance of divine favor. Love him who first loved you. Very beautiful. So in, in the midst of the church, uh, in the midst of, of some things that Luther is going to recognize as, as not being as coming from the scriptures and not, not being a part of what God's revelation, God's plan of salvation is, he found someone who understood the love of God. And so Staupitz's encouragement uh, gave Luther some balance. And Luther threw himself into his study. I, I threw the pictures in there in, in disorder, but here we are. He began to study the Bible, and, uh, and he began to lecture on the book of Psalms, the Gospels, and the Epistles. And uh, this was his job. He, he got a, a job there uh, as a lecturer. And then he was encouraged to take the pulpit. Now, uh, you understand from how he, he treated himself and how he viewed himself before God that, that he was reticent to take the pulpit. But Staupitz, again, his friend, encouraged him to take the pulpit. And once he began the pulpit, he never left it. And he was, a, he was mighty in the pulpit, and he, he spoke powerfully. And, and the more that he delved into the scriptures, the more powerful his messages became. And, and people loved to hear Luther preach the word. Well, uh, shortly thereafter, he went on a pilgrimage. He left um, and went to the eternal city, they call it, to Rome. And as he saw Rome in the distance, he looked and he said, Holy Rome, I salute thee. He was looking forward to going to this holy city and seeing the, the saints and to see the, the leadership of the church and, and all of their, uh, their devotion to God. This was the, uh, the most uh, holy place on the earth, he believed. But as he went into Rome and he began to observe uh, some of the uh, behaviors and uh, some of the... Um, Things I'm, I'm not even going to mention. You can look up the chapter and, and, and look at the histories. The debauchery that was in Rome, he found just the opposite of what he expected. And he said, uh, no one can imagine what sins and infamous actions are committed in Rome. They must be seen and heard to be believed. Thus, they are in the habit of saying, if there is a hell, Rome is built over it. It is an abyss whence issues every kind of sin. Um, this was a, quite a turnoff to him. But in his devotion, he, he sought to come closer to God. And there was something in particular in Rome that, uh, that called his attention. Many of the pilgrims that came to Rome would go to this place that was a, a, a stairway that was supposedly Pilate's staircase that had supposedly miraculously been transported from Jerusalem to Rome, and that if you would go up these stairs um, doing your penances as you went up, the, crawling up the stairs on your knees, that you would find through this uh, voluntary humility uh, a, a closeness to God. You would be brought to God. But as he was halfway up the stairs, what he had been reading in the epistles rang in his ears from Romans chapter 1. The just shall live by faith. We were talking this morning in the Sabbath school class about looking at the Bible with dirty glasses. You know, you, you look at it and you don't quite see what's really there. But God was cleaning his glasses so that when he read the word of God, he began to understand what it was saying. And, and the, the, the things that had come into the church began to come into focus that, that they were not part of what God's plan was, but that God would have us to approach him through faith. And this was a breakthrough 
for Luther. He got up from his knees halfway up the stairs and walked down. And this passage, this concept of faith being the connection that draws us to God was forever after to be the, the beacon light for his experience and for his teaching from the word of God. And so much so that uh, kind of a, a one-eyed viewer of scripture, he didn't understand quite fully uh, the relationship between faith and works, the good works of God. He, he didn't fully get that into focus, although later on he did say, now that you've become the children of God, act like, like one. So he did understand that, that faith is to resonate in our lives, that we are to live lives that are the lives of those who have been redeemed. That was a turning point for Luther. And from there, he, he went back to his pulpit. He began to, to preach. And uh, Martin Luther was a changed man. And his, his relationship with the church uh, began to stretch even further. And he began to see more and more issues within the church that, that, that just could not be what he was reading in the scriptures. And of course, they had not come from the scriptures, these many teachings. And principal among these was uh, something that was promoted by this, this little um, toady fellow, um, Staupitz, uh, this was, um, um, not Staupitz, this is Tetzel, Johannes Tetzel. Um, the description of Tetzel was that he had been, uh, uh, what, what he had, he had engaged himself in a number of things that, that he was, uh, his reputation was messed up, but he was a, a, a good salesman. And so as a good salesman, the, the church had kind of overlooked his past behavior and put him in charge of uh, basically fundraising for the church um, through the means of these indulgences that he would, he would sell to the people. And he taught the people that, uh, that if they had these indulgences, it was a surefire acceptance with God, um, releasing, they could use it for themselves, they could also use it for releasing people from purgatory. In fact, um, he said, that not even repentance was necessary if you owned one of these. You could just present it before God. Now, I have heard some similar uh, speech made by Christians who supposedly should know better, who understood that we are saved by faith. They said that, that once they got their title to eternal life, that they, they were going to be able to, to wave that before God in eternity and say, you, you've promised me, here I've got my ticket, let me in. Again, th this is a misrepresentation of what the Christian life is. Uh, it's about a broken heart, a heart that is turned to God, a, a heart that, that, that turns away from this world and its motivations and is warmed by the love of Christ and, and transformed. And so a, they said not even repentance is necessary, and uh, some of you recall the, the, this little uh, line that they gave, as soon as the coin in the coffer sings, the soul from purgatory springs. Uh, that was off the top of our head. It may be just worded slightly different than that. But the, the notion is that you can pay your way into heaven. But the truth is that there is a heavenly high priest who receives all who come to him with a broken heart. As we read in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't pay your way into heaven. We had an offering this morning, and people gave because they believed in, in the motivation, the, um, the church's um, goals, and, and um, so we gave. But we didn't do it because we're trying to please God or we're trying to show off to other people or 
or any other motivation. We give because we believe in the mission of the church. We believe that there is a need and that we can help and that God has blessed us and we can help. But there's nothing in that with, with any kind of motivation of, of gaining favor with God. You can give everything you've got. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, you can give even your body to be burned. And if you have not love, it profits nothing. So it's only when we have the relationship with him that the love of Christ that's been poured out upon us that we respond in love to the one who loved us, as Staupitz told Luther. When we respond to that great, great love, that's what is of value. That's what matters to our Heavenly Father. If we love him back who has loved us so. So he, he didn't understand that. And, and um, some of Luther's members brought to him one of these indulgences asking for forgiveness for their sins. And he says, it, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And they went back and they complained uh, to Tetzel. And, and Tetzel said, I'm going to get you kicked out of the church. And well, you know, he might have been doing him a favor at that point. But uh, Luther was still a loyal member of the church, just hoping that other people could see what he saw from the word of God. Oh, we actually tore some of them up. My goodness, that would have been quite quite a, a, a vigorous response. Well, anyway, um, you have heard about the Wittenberg door, right? He, he's teaching. He was teaching in Wittenberg, and um, there was a, a special event that was coming up. Uh, one of the the things that the church did quite often was if you would come to see the relics, that could be used as as favor with God. And relics meant uh, pieces of bones and uh, old clothing that, pe that the saints wore and, and all kinds of, uh, of things that were supposedly gave merit. So they, they brought this kind of traveling show of the bones of the, of the saints and people would go to see the bones of the saints would get some kind of special dispensation from heaven. And All Saints Day was coming up you know, All Saints Day is on, still on our calendar, but very few people really know what it is. Um, it's, it, you may get some emphasis in, in some churches, the Catholic Church, and, and maybe some other churches uh, to some degree, but uh, All Saints Day was a day to honor the saints. Um, it also happens to be the day after Halloween. All Hallows Eve, yes. And so on October 31st, Halloween, 1517. Hmm, 1517. That's 500 years ago. Yeah, this year. In October 31st, 1517, Luther nailed to the door of the Wittenberg Church his 95 theses. I purchased a copy of the translation of his 95 Theses uh, a few years ago. This is from the writings of, of Luther. And uh, I was amazed. The vast majority of them talk up specifically about the, the indulgences and their um, contradiction of, of Scripture. Um, I could read a, a few of these to you just to give you some flavor of it, but I, I was surprised because I didn't understand the notion of what it meant to nail something to the door. You can see up there, there are other things nailed to the door besides what he's putting up there. The door was like a bulletin board. People would go by and see things that were coming up. The That's what it is. So when he nailed the 95 theses, it was in, he was issuing a challenge to debate. And as far as I know, no one took him up on it. They probably would have lost. Anyway, uh, the, the notice that he put up on the door did create quite a stir. This is in a in university setting. And so lots of people were interested in new ideas and new things. And, and young people are just 
looking into things like that, and they took copies of them. And of course, at this point in history, Gutenberg had had uh, pres was uh, printing, and so they were able to to mass produce 90, these 95 theses and and send them out all over the place for people to consider. Well, let me just read you a couple of them that I highlighted in here. They preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. It is certain that when money clinks in the money chest, greed and avarice can be increased, but when the church intercedes, the result is in the hands of God alone. Any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt, even without indulgence letters. Christians are taught that the Pope, in granting indulgences, needs and thus desires their devout prayer more than their money, and so on. What does the Pope remit or grant to those who, but perfect, who by perfect contrition already have a right to full remission and blessings? In other words, God's promised to give his forgiveness to those who confess their sins. And, and so he, he presented a challenge that was unmet, except in the way that the church was known in those ages for doing. He was called to respond to his challenges. And as he continued to teach from the word, and we will not uh, go too far into this uh, into this study today, he began to teach the, the, his understanding of scripture and the, the basis of scripture and that it, was, that it was not a mechanical thing, but it was a spiritual connection with God. Notice what he wrote to one of the friends of the Reformation. We cannot attain to the understanding of scripture either by study or by intellect. Your first duty is to begin by prayer. Entreat the Lord to grant you of his great mercy the true understanding of his word. There is no other interpreter of the word of God than the author of this word. And so he began to understand the value of the scriptures. He began to proclaim it and he presented what was to become one of the principles of the Reformation, sola scriptura, that God's word is the foundation of our faith. And he turned more and more to the word of God in his preaching. Interestingly, some of the things that, that Luther uh, spoke off the record, not necessarily uh, uh, in his, his stated writings, there were, there were things that were going through his mind on, on some of the subjects that, he, that did not become part of Lutheran doctrine as the Lutheran church separated from the Roman Catholic church eventually. But it, it was part of what he was considering as he began to study the word of God. And one of those had to do with the state of the dead. He, under, he began to understand about uh, the, the truth that the Bible talks about uh, sleeping and death. And he talked about how that one day that Jesus would call his name and call him from his, the sleeping slumber of death. Another thing that uh, I had somebody actually challenge me, said, Luther couldn't have said that. But uh, in, as in his later years, he went back and he began to study the uh, writings of Moses. And as he studied the book of Genesis, he came to the conviction that the Sabbath was established at the creation and that it was made and devoted to God and his writings on that. I, I shared that with a, a lady that became a Lutheran and she said, he couldn't have written that. And I said, I have all of Luther's writings on CD-ROM and that's where I got this. And I gave her the references and everything to it. So he, he, as he continued to study the word of God, had he continued, he never finished his series on the writings of Moses. He died before he completed it. Had he continued, who, who knows where he would have gone because he had stumbled upon the, the, in, uh, the teaching of God's word. As we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, if, if he understood that, he, he could have seen that, that, that um, salvation is not just being saved from sin and saved from hell, but that salvation is being saved to live in the life of Christ, to, to walk in his good works, to, to know all of God's good ways. And, and so he, he could have seen that, that broader picture. He was beginning to see that broader picture, even as a, a, a fallible human being, but as one who loved Jesus, who loved his word. And we see the eagle that was predicted by Huss, who said, 100 years hence, an eagle shall arise. And we find that the eagle of Luther, the eagle, Adam, <laughs> yes, the eagle took flight. The Reformation began. <laughs> yeah, he's doing great back there. He's got, he's got um, some company in that room, so we appreciate what he does. The eagle had taken flight. The eagle launched the Reformation. Now, that doesn't mean that, that he had everything, but he, he was on the right track. He found that righteousness comes by faith, a, a relationship with Christ. He recognized that, and that's sola fide, he, he recognized that truth comes from God's word, and that's sola scriptura. He, he established the principles upon which others would stand and would continue. Now, there's a little bit more to the this, this story of Luther. We're going to share that in two weeks. And uh, we'll look forward to, to finishing out as the eagle continues in his flight as the Reformation goes forward. So how did the truth triumph. How did Jesus triumph here? The triumph of God's love. In spite of what others would say, in spite of the pressures of the church, this man who said, I, I, I'm not just motivated by the Spirit, I am pushed forward by the Spirit. I, I cannot restrain the Spirit's working in my life. He, he took the church on in its its misrepresentation of the gospel and its misrepresentation of Christ. He took it on. One man. Uh, there was a fellow that met him on the street. I heard this, this story about him. A fellow that was carrying a pistol. And he said, aren't you afraid of, uh, of, the, of the church? And he said, what can they do to me? They can, they can shorten this life just uh, a few days, but, uh, but my life is in Christ. And the man was shaken, and he ran, fled away from, from Luther as a result. The Reformation took wings. The truth of God in its restoration took wings. And we stand in the, we feel the, the movement of those wings even to this day. It is because of that that we have the, the, the ability to come to God's word, to know very simply some of these things, you know, when I, when I read them, I thought, well, that's no big deal because I grew up knowing it, taking it for granted because we'd, we'd heard these things. But what if Luther had never come? What if God had not moved upon his heart, spoken through Staupitz, uh, shown him this experience and, and the contrast of ways? What if all that had happened? Where would we be today? What relationship would you have with God today? God was at, at work. God continues to build his church. And as we close our worship service, I'd like for us to sing that great hymn that Luther himself wrote. It's been translated into English. We don't have to sing it. Ein feste Burg ist unter Gott. We'll sing, A mighty fortress is our God. And remember what God did in the life of Martin and what he can do with anyone who will stand 
for him. Let us stand as we sing, A Mighty Fortress. bow in prayer. O Lord our God, you are stronger than our weakness. You are mightier and more you know all things and we are mere human beings. But in your strength we can overcome not only the challenges of our lives but in this great controversy that began when Satan once Lucifer rebelled in heaven and continues through the ages in the lives of the hearts of human beings to this day as we see it playing out in our own lives and in the politics of the day and in the struggles within the world, the conflicts continue to go on between good and evil. And today, Lord, 
we would submit our hearts to you, that you would fill us with your spirit, your goodness, and your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.